What's up, people of the internet? I'm Dave Rubin. This is the Rubin Report Direct Message. I am back in studio after a week in the great state of Florida. It's November 8th, 2021, and I'm in the mood to be here. I just had a great freaking week. Before I tell you about my great freaking week, uh, as always, you can chat live during the show. My assistant, Helen, is in the chat right now over at rubinreport.locals.com. She's looking at your comments. She's sending Michael, who's sitting right there, questions and comments throughout the show that I might just read live on air. As always now, we are live streaming on Rumble, we're live streaming on the YouTube, and we are live streaming, of course, on Blaze TV. And yeah, I just had an absolutely great, I think it was eight days in Florida. I was up in Orlando for a couple days at the National Conservatism Conference. If you haven't seen some of the interviews that I did, I sat down with Jack Posobiec and Chris Rufo and Liz Wheeler. I saw Ted Cruz. Uh, it was just wonderful. I gave a couple of talks. I did a little VIP uh, impromptu speech right at the beginning of the event, which that we did post on YouTube already. So you can check that out. And then I gave my my big speech on the on the closing day. And then out of nowhere, we were able to pull it together. Uh, you guys know Jonathan Isaac, the NBA player on the Orlando Magic, who has come out against vaccine mandates, not against vaccines. Uh, he has had COVID. He believes in natural immunity and antibodies and herd immunity and things of that nature and health and being young and eating right and exercising. Uh, I've been in touch with him for the last couple of weeks and I was able to grab him because he plays for the Orlando Magic and the event was in Orlando. Uh, and we did a quick interview. I'd say it was about 20, 25 minutes at the final dinner of the event. We are getting the video, which we will post. It was just spectacular. This guy, I think he's 22 years old. Can we check on Jonathan Isaac, 22 or so? He is so smart, wise, kind, decent, doesn't want to be out there talking about this stuff, but has stepped into the limelight. And it's just so great. You know, I've had the, the privilege of... Uh, privilege in a true sense of privilege, not the way the left uses privilege, privilege of sitting down with some people who just sort of fall into something and then like become who they're supposed to be. And this guy is just absolutely one of those people. He's 24 years old. He's the wise old age of 24. So we'll get that up for you soon. And Florida, let me just say, it was so absolutely wonderful. Of course, the weather is great, but it basically is as if COVID does not exist there. There is pretty much nobody in masks everybody's living their life. Every restaurant we went to was absolutely packed. Every beach, just wandering around, taking the city in. Occasionally you'd see a, a mass person, you'd be like, oh, there's something wrong with them. Like it's the complete flip of what I'm living through here in LA, at least for now. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like it's here, it's like everybody's masked. And if you see a non mass person, you're like, uh oh, I'm, I'm with you, are you all right? But there it was just like, everybody was just out Things were packed and normal. And if you weren't scrolling on Twitter, you wouldn't even know that this pandemic or whatever they want to call it at this point even exists anymore. Uh, and then final thought, I get back here and the first news I hear is that Gavin Newsom, you know I don't like this guy, this walking evil Disney cartoon villain, he apparently got the COVID vaccine or he got his booster shot on October 27th. And he has not been seen in public since for 11 days. He has just gone completely MIA. No one knows where he is. Now a normal person, if, if you know being a politician was a regular job, if you just didn't show up for your job for 11 days, people might start asking questions. I'm sort of happy about this. Like, I don't think we need this guy around, so who knows where he is. Um, I don't wish him ill, despite the ill that he has, he has thrust on everyone here in California. Um, but it is a little weird. We haven't heard from him in 11 days since the booster shot. And then someone mentioned to me this morning, that uh, Jen Psaki, the White House press secretary, Jen Psaki, you know her, we've talked about her a little bit, uh, that she announced she had COVID about a week ago, also vaccinated, of course, and she's been MIA. No one's heard from her uh, in about a week. So I don't know what's going on. Just, uh, just, just giving you little bites of information and you can do what you wish with them. Uh, we got a bunch of stuff that I wanna get to on the show today. First off, I'm sure most of you have seen it already, but Big Bird has come out for vaccine mandates, basically. Uh, he's a Muppet. And then the puppet, Joe Biden, who's in the White House, they started tweeting back and forth at each other. So we'll get into that. And then some stuff just related to kids. And we got some crazy video out of China about what they're doing with kids and mandates. And it's coming here, people, because everyone's just folding like a paper bag, except for specific states in the United States. Florida, you are one of them. 
Uh, COVID vaccines. We're going to talk about that and masks and the CDC people, all that stuff. And then finally, so it's three stories basically today. This guy, Michael Eric Dyson, we've shown you a little video of him over time. He's a guest on MSNBC a lot. And he went on like a completely insane racist rant. And the only place that we uh, accept racism in America is when it comes from the left and it's usually being pushed out there by MSNBC. This guy's on Bill Maher's show a lot. And he just went on this crazy racist rant and then it reminded uh, Michael of a video that this guy did about two years ago. He did a monk debate uh, with my friend Jordan Peterson, where he called Jordan Peterson a mean old white man. I believe that was the exact quote. Uh, so we're going to show you that. We're going to show you. We're going to basically show it to you, and then say to you, "Who do you think the racist is?" You'll let me know uh, before we get to any of that, guys. Man, I really I'm in the mood to be here today. I am in the mood to be here. I always am, but like I'm particularly in the mood to be here today. It's that Florida, it's that sun and that air, man. It's, it's a little moist, you can kind of taste it. And the coffee's good down there. I had some amazing Cuban coffee and the food was, oh, I'll just say one other thing about the food. So I don't really go out to restaurants here at LA. I basically, I, I, I'm sort of hunkered down in my bunker here. I don't go out that often. Um, and we host a lot of people and that sort of thing. Um, but we went out to dinner a couple times, took my team out, went out with some of the locals guys and everything. Went to uh, Houston's restaurant, which you might know as Hillstone. Some of them are called Hillstone. Some of them are called Houston's, which is really like one of the greatest chains that we've got in America. Like I know people make fun of like restaurant chains somehow that that's not good. But Houston's, they not only is the food great, the service great, everything about the restaurant there. This is not an endorsement or an advertisement or anything like that. Well, it's an endorsement, but it's not an advertisement. But just to see a place that like everything was working. Like just to see a place where workers were happy and they let the workers, if you wanted to wear, wear a mask, wear a mask. If you don't, don't. Like just to see a place where the service was great, the food was great, it was packed, the atmosphere was great, people were smiling. It doesn't take much, man. It doesn't take much. Uh, all right, before we get to any of that, I want to talk to you guys about Black Rifle Coffee. I've got the mug right here. Uh, you know, they are not the typical coffee, coffee company. Black Rifle Coffee Company develops their explosive roast profiles with the same mission focus they learned as military members serving this great country. And with every purchase you make, they give back. Black Rifle imports high quality coffee beans from Colombia and Brazil and roast five days a week at their facilities in Manchester, Tennessee and Salt Lake City, Utah. Black Rifle Coffee donated over 150,000 pounds of coffee. That's over 6 million cups to soldiers deployed overseas, law enforcement officers, wildland firefighters on the West Coast and medical workers during the COVID-19 response just in 2020 alone. For every coffee purchase you make through the month of November, Black Rifle will send a bag of their limited edition holiday 30 presents out roast to a service member currently deployed overseas to be delivered by Christmas morning. Being founded and operated by veterans, the team at Black Rifle Coffee knows what a quality cup of coffee means to active duty troops spending the holidays away from home Want to support the cause? Go to blackriflecoffee.com slash Ruben today and check out the freshest coffee in America, blackriflecoffee.com slash Ruben and get 20% off your coffee, apparel, and gear, as well as 20% off your first month of the coffee club. Purchase blackriflecoffee.com slash Ruben and use code Ruben for 20% off uh, your purchase, including your first coffee club order. That's blackriflecoffee.com slash Ruben. And now back to me. I think I'm going to have a sip of delicious coffee after I said the word coffee 87 times right there. Okay, so here's the story, people. They're coming for your kids now, right? Like it was one thing they came for all the adults. Everyone got injected, then got double injected, now booster injected, and you'll get 87 other injections. And then suddenly they'll tell you things don't work the way they're supposed to work. And oh, sure, maybe you're going blind or your heart's enlarged or blah, blah, blah. But you're going to keep doing it if you've gone down this path with them because they're the good guys and they care about you. Well, now they're really coming for your kids. And we've got a couple of videos here that are just going to blow your mind. Here's Big Bird talking about COVID. Do you not have a poo poo? Oh, oh, no, Amita, this is from my COVID vaccine. My mommy and my papi took me to get it this morning. Mm -hmm. oh, Rosita, that's great. Getting the COVID vaccine is a great way to stay healthy. See, my mommy and my papi said that it will help keep me, my friends, my neighbors, my abuela all healthy. Your parents are absolutely right. You know, COVID vaccines are now available for children five years and older. And the more people who get them, the better we're going to be able to help stop the spread of COVID and keep everyone healthy. 
Okay, so the main Muppet that you saw there was CNN Sanjay Gupta, who of course got owned by Joe Rogan just a couple weeks ago. We played that video for you. He also played a doctor uh, known as Sanjay Gupta in the movie Contagion, where he was pushing an imaginary drug called Ribavarin. Uh, we've shown you that clip as well. Uh, sorry, uh, Big Bird himself did not actually speak there. We're gonna get to the Big Bird tweet in a moment. I don't know who those other two characters are there, but for the green one, who was concerned about, I don't know if that was a boy or a girl, was that a boy or a girl? Or I guess it's just a genderless, hairy Muppet with some weirdo's hand up its butt. Um, that was uh, his abuela or her abuela. If the vaccines work, then your abuela wouldn't need you to get vaccinated too, you green freak. Um, anyway, let's talk about Big Bird, because even though I don't know that red one, was that Elmo? That wasn't Elmo, was it? Or it wasn't Elmo and the green one, I don't know. Been a little out of the Sesame Street game, you'll have to pardon me. But anyway, putting those people, uh, creatures aside, a big bird who is verified on Twitter. Okay, I did not know that birds could be verified on Twitter. He tweeted this. It's just so perfect. I got the COVID-19 vaccine today. My wing is feeling a little sore, but it'll give my body an extra protective boost that keeps me and others healthy. Miss Erica Hill even said, I've been getting vaccines since I was a little bird. I had no idea. And then that tweet was followed up by our puppet in chief, Joe Biden, who said, good on ya, big bird. Getting vaccinated is the best way to keep your whole neighborhood safe. Now, of course, let me first say something, which is that big bird is not a real bird that's talking that's huge. Big bird is the product of a, sorry, Connor, I freaked you out on that one. I just, he just, you should have seen the, I'm sorry about that. I, you know, Santa Claus doesn't exist either. You know, it's a lot. Uh, Big Bird is a construct made at this point by PBS, at one time Jim Henson, who's long gone, uh, that promotes leftist ideology, right? So there were a lot of conservatives or right-leaning people on Twitter that were attacking Big Bird over this. And then I saw the lefties going, see, they're afraid of a big bird. They're afraid of a little children's bird. And it's like, no, nobody's afraid of Big Bird or the weirdo who lives in Big Bird's outfit or any of that stuff. Nobody's afraid of that. But when you're indoctrinating children, to think that they must be injected with this thing, which as we talked about two weeks ago, the FDA panel that just approved the vaccines for five to 11 year olds, they actually said, one of the 17 board members said, we don't know what this is gonna do to the kids. We got to inject them and then we'll figure it out. Uh, it's not that anyone's being triggered or needs a safe space because of Big Bird. It's that Big Bird and Sesame Street represent giant money and interests that mostly happen to be leftist, Democrat, inject you with whatever we want to inject you with, interests. So that is, the, uh, that is the issue with Big Bird. I am not making this about Big Bird himself, the character of Big Bird. They are using Big Bird as a proxy for their authoritarian lunacy, okay? And then of course, Joe Biden responding to that. I mean, it's just so stupid. It's like, do you think there is any chance, like even a 1% chance that they let Joe Biden tweet? Like there is zero, percent chance. They do not let Joe Biden tweet. So it's all just this game. It's this kayfabe, which I've talked about that phrase before, K-A-Y-F-A-B-E, this idea that we can present a fake reality and you'll have real reactions to it, much like professional wrestling. It's this nonstop kayfabe. We get this ridiculous children's cartoon character, Muppet, to base, is, is Big Bird technically a Muppet? I mean, the Muppets, you know, that was, you got your Kermit, you got your Miss Piggy, uh, Gonzo, but then, uh, then you got the Sesame Street, but I guess they're all still, they're a type of Muppet, I suppose. But anyway, you've got your Muppet and your puppet, and they're just going back and forth for the rest of us to watch on all of this. And also the more that they tell these kids that they have to get the vaccine so they don't get Abuela sick, is also basically telling these kids the vaccines don't work. Because if the vaccines worked and Abuela took the vaccine, then Abuela would be bueno, even if you were sicko, you get it? So they're just absolutely ridiculous. But this is just the beginning. This is just the beginning uh, because China is really pushing a lot of this stuff. It may well be that the lab leak from Wuhan was, was intentional by the Chinese. We don't know. I, I actually don't know. I won't pretend to know, but I think we should at least be asking those questions as Rand Paul and others have. Uh, but basically all the countries, the Western countries in the world seem to be coming a little more like China these days. We're a little more authoritarian, aren't we? So perhaps China got us to fall on our own sword and do all sorts of weird things to ourselves. Well, look what's going on in China right now. These are kindergartners with QR codes hung around their necks in queue 
for COVID testing. All right, so I, I don't know what they were saying right there. I don't speak Chinese, obviously. It doesn't even matter. That was video from the post-millennial. Like, if that's not disturbing to you, that we are turning children into little robots, we are injecting them with things who would, that are not fully tested by people who would gladly keep you masked forever and locked in your house and everything else. It's like, this, this ain't good. And we're kind of becoming more like China than say China is becoming more like us, right? I think I talked a little bit about this with uh, Blake Masters a couple weeks ago who's running for uh, Senate in Arizona. And he talked about how we got involved with China in the last 10, 20 years thinking that we could westernize them, that we could bring them the ideas of liberalism and that, that it would help them open their society. But it's actually worked backwards. We seem to be becoming more like China than they seem to becoming more like us. But again, this is coming for the kids. You know, right now they want to inject five to 11 year olds. They're gonna be doing this in all sorts of blue states and we'll see what happens with the red states. And I don't know, I mean, I really, I, I'd love to hear actually, if some of you are parents in the Ruben Report community and you're watching this right now, uh, and any of you can join us at rubenreport.locals.com in the chat, I, I would love to hear some of your thoughts on this. If you live in a state that's gonna force you to inject your kids, like why aren't you leaving? And I get what a horrific decision that is. You have roots, you have a family, you have, you have how, a house and a career and all of those things. But like when they're literally coming for your kids, you know, when they're saying to you, we don't know why we're doing this and the vaccines I guess don't really work, but we're gonna inject your kids with the stuff. Like maybe you gotta move, you gotta get out. Like what else can they take from you if? if they can take your own capacity over your, your children's health. It really does make you wonder. Uh, all right, let's talk to you guys about ladders real quick. You know, I wanna talk for just a minute about the things that have fundamentally changed the way we live. These things are the disruptors, things like smartphones, streaming services, or dogs named Clyde who like to jump on you each time you come home. He mauled me yesterday. Another disruptor I heard of recently is a company called Ladder who basically took the life insurance industry, flipped it upside down and shook out the inefficiencies. Before ladder, if you wanted to get life insurance, you had to sit and drive, or sorry, you had to drive across town, uh, sit through a sales pitch, fill out a ton of paperwork, and then wait six to eight weeks to find out if you've been approved. You'd also receive a zillion phone calls from agents trying to bundle your life insurance with things like car insurance. Now with ladder, you can get fast, affordable term life insurance without leaving home. It's 100% digital when you apply for $3 million or less in coverage. No doctors, no needles, no paperwork. So if you're between 20 and 60, need coverage and want to team up with a company that's redeeming life insurance, choose Ladder. The process is super quick and easy. Go to ladderlife.com slash Ruben today and see if you're instantly approved. That's Ladder, L-A-D-D-E-R, life.com slash Ruben, ladderlife.com slash Ruben. And now back to me. Okay, so there's plenty more related to this COVID situation. And I was debating this morning, like how much stuff did I want to do about COVID because the news seems to be just like completely littered with it again, even though for the most part, people are trying to just move on with their lives. But this is one of the issues that we're gonna have to deal with in the world going forward, no matter how much a certain set of us, I think the majority of us wanna move forward with our lives, wanna make choices for ourselves, wanna just get out of this nonstop awful feeling that we're in with COVID and, and government, uh, government overreach on our lives. Uh, they're just gonna keep coming. So I felt like we had to cover some of this stuff. Um, so here's a video of our Surgeon General. Now this is our same Surgeon General, who you may remember two weeks ago, said that Rachel Levine was the first female four-star general, whatever the hell it is that she is. Uh, but of course, she's not a female. Uh, she does not have ovaries. She is a biological male who's living as a trans woman. That's just fine, right? That's just great. More power to her. Uh, but he called her a female, so I'm a little already, I've got a little red flag uh, about his decision-making process. Well, here's the Surgeon General talking about federal vaccine mandates now for small businesses, not just those hundred plus businesses, the small businesses as well. Dr. Murthy, if the law survives legal challenges, will the administration be extending the mandate to smaller employers with fewer than 100 employers, employees? Well, Martha, certainly nothing is off the table at this moment, but the focus right now is on implementing uh, the current rule that OSHA put out. 
Nothing's off the table. Nothing's off the table. We could nuke half the country. We could just do anything. Nothing is off the table with these freaks that don't listen to us no matter how many times we get everything wrong. I don't like this guy. I don't think he's very good at his job. I don't think he's honest or decent. And I don't think he cares about individual liberty. I don't think he cares about the Constitution or anything else. I just want to be very clear. I've got Michael here. I've got Connor here. Guys, I will never force you to be injected with anything. And if I did force my employees to be injected with something to work for me, I would not be a good person, right? I don't know all of their health habits. I, do you guys both brush your teeth? You both brush your teeth this morning, right? We've never had breath issues around here. Uh, or I don't know how much deodorant they put on. I don't know exactly when they go to the gym or whatever. And it's none of my business. If they started not brushing their teeth and never exercising and they started smelling and whatever, then I might say to them, we got a problem here, guys. We're in a small studio. You smell like we got an issue. But I, what business would it be? I am a small business owner, right? I have a bunch of employees, bunch of full-timers, bunch of part-timers. We're growing, actually. We're gonna be hiring more people. Like, there's a lot of good stuff going on here. Imagine how insane it would be if I, as an employer of just, uh, it's a job, like this is a job. You guys know you're not slaves, right? You are free to go. Did you know that? You could walk out that door right now. I'm not kidding, I'm not kidding. Um, I don't own these people. Like they're allowed to make medical decisions for themselves, but the government is, has become, the federal government of the United States has become the most psychotic, evil, totalitarian regime that, I, that would be almost possible. Now I, I say that with some hesitation because I do believe these people can get worse, right? Like of course they can get worse. They always double down and get worse. But the idea that they would push not only these big companies, okay, so fine, me, first of all, I don't think this, but I could see how someone could make an argument. Well, these big companies, there's so many people there and you've got to vaccinate, okay, fine. But little companies with people that are making decisions for themselves, like, will you guys make a commitment if you're, if you're vomiting, say, in the morning, would you perhaps not come in? You'd, you'd be okay with that? And if you were puking your brains out, he still wants to come to work. But you, because these are good workers that I have here, you see? But the point is, I don't have dominion over these people. And I promise you guys, I will never force anyone to make any medical decision to work for me. You know, if either one of you came in and you were pregnant, whatever it might be, it's none of my business. It's fine, that's just how it is. All right. Um, but I won't, you know, if you start becoming real fat, then I gotta get rid of you because that I can't have, we're in a small room here, it's enough, enough. Uh, all right, so if that isn't enough, just like these ridiculous, ridiculous people, uh, New, Jersey, New Jersey Governor Murphy, this is the Democrat who just got reelected by a hair. He almost got uh, taken out a couple days ago in the election. Like he just, they just missed it there. And New Jersey has made their decision. They wanna go blue stupid. Um, so now they've got this guy, he's on with George Stephanopoulos, talking about when uh, we could maybe take masks off kids. And yeah, you're not gonna like the answer. Fatigue, everybody has it. I think you know it. Probably people that abide by the rules have it. Uh, considering that that seemed to be a little bit of a motivator for some, are you at all thinking about some relief on any of your mandates? Listen, there's mandate fatigue everywhere, including with yours truly, so let there be no doubt about that. Um, at the moment, no, but my, my hope is particularly with our kids under the age of 12 that now being able to get the vaccine that we will at some day sooner than later be able to lift the mask mandate that we have in schools. That, that is my fervent hope. We're not there yet, uh, but please God, we can get there sooner than later. We gotta get there safely, responsibly, but I believe we can get there and I hope it's sooner than later. Oh, it's just perfect. He's the perfect Democrat because he's exactly like Fauci. He just says nothing using a lot of words. He hopes we can get there. You know, maybe we can get there one day. Notice he never gives you numbers. We'd need to see this number so we could do this, even if any of this made sense. And we know that masks don't even make sense in the first place. But congratulations, Jersey, you voted this guy in. So inject your kids and keep them in masks forever. And by the way, the winter's coming and then they'll tell you, oh, nope, dip, 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 dip. you know, we've even got some flu coming in. So we better keep the mask because of the flu. We'll have more on that in just a second. Um, but it's just like, why are you giving these people power? Why are you paying attention to these people? I, I'm hungover from Florida. I'm hungover on freedom right now. I saw the promised land. I've been to the promised land in the Everglades. Now we've got CDC Director Rochelle Walensky, this piece of work, and now she just wants masks forever. I'm guessing she's got some money in a mask company. Uh, meh, take a look. The evidence is clear. 
Masks can help prevent the spread of COVID-19 by reducing your chance of infection by more than 80%. Whether it's an infection from the flu, from the coronavirus, or even just the common cold. In combination with other steps like getting your vaccination, hand washing, and keeping physical distance, wearing your mask is an important step you can take to keep us all healthy. Get vaccine facts. We can do this. Oh, blow it out your ass, lady. I just can't. Is that a phrase? Did I just make up that phrase? I don't even know if that's a phrase. I, I can't deal with these people anymore. Because what she's saying there is masks reduce the chance you're going to get sick by 80%. But she said from COVID, flu, and even the common cold. Well, yes, people get the common cold. We've been getting the common cold for thousands of years. People have been getting the flu for a long time. And usually they survive. And you know who really often survives these things? Kids. Uh, but they want to inject the kids and all of that nonsense. And it's like, do you see the mission creep here? This is what we would call mission creep. You go, mission creep usually is thought of as a military phrase. You know, you go to war for one reason. We want to liberate these people. Next thing you know, it's 20 years later. And uh, Joe Biden, you know, took the whole uh, U.S. military out of Afghanistan, a lot of dead people. We left a whole army there and, you know, weapons and everything else. Like mission creep is just you have an original intention and then it becomes something else. So I don't know what the deal is with her. Like, I'm, I'm tired of saying that these people's intentions are good. But if you think she's wearing masks privately, and if you think that that fool Murphy up in Jersey is wearing masks privately, there was a video, we played it months ago with Murphy when he was telling everyone to mask up and he got caught at a restaurant with his family without masks. And it was just great, that video. We should, maybe we'll play it for tomorrow. This like perfect, like quintessential, like Carmine, Carmella lady from The Sopranos just walks up to him and she's like, you motherfucker, motherfucker, what the fuck, you mother, oh, I can't curse, damn. Well, we just got demonetized, I've enjoyed the cash. <laughs> um, but she's basically like the perfect, like Italian Jersey mom, just like, you know, you're locking all our kids away and here you are eating at the restaurant. You mother, blah, 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 blah. Uh, Anyway, with all of that being said, I thought, Dave, we're, this is a dark place. We're going to the sunken place. We're gonna depress people. Is there anyone out there that's sane? Could there be a governor of a state that's doing it right who wants to free the people? Q, DeSantis. A year and a half ago, we started with 15 days to slow the spread, and, and now it's gone to get jabbed or lose your job. And today's OSHA rule, a uh, very long time coming, we were, we were waiting for it, uh, that was issued, if you look at it, uh, here it is, it's almost 500 pages. And so we're supposed to be a government of laws, not a government of men. Uh, this is 500 pages of a government of a bureaucracy, a government that is being run by executive edict, not in accordance with the typical constitutional processes. And uh, the state of Florida is gonna respond and we will combat uh, the OSHA rule. As soon as it's published, uh, the state of Florida will be joining with Georgia and Alabama, as well as private plaintiffs uh, to file suit. Uh, this is a rule that is not consistent with the Constitution and is not legally authorized through congressional statute. Isn't it refreshing to hear sanity? It really is. Like we live in such an insane time then when someone comes out there and says, you know, we're gonna have to look at stuff and I don't wanna rule over you and I'm not a king and, you know, we've had this mission creep and they told you one thing, but now they want something else, et cetera, et cetera. And he says it calmly and thoughtfully. Uh, it's, it's just so deeply refreshing. You guys know I was at this dinner with DeSantis uh, two, three weeks ago, sat next to him for about three hours at the table. The guy gets it. He's a good, decent man. Help us, Ron DeSantis. You're our only hope. So that was just refreshing. So I wanted to end with that, and we got one more, one more story for you today. So one of the things I've been talking about for quite some time is that the only place that there's real racism left in America is on the left, right? Like, of course there are individual racist people. There, there are bad people. It's just how it is. There are mean people. There are people who do not like black people. There are people who don't like Jews. There are people who don't like white people. There are people who don't like gays. There are people who don't like straights. But the only place in America that any of this is okay, and not only okay, but actually manufactured and then pushed out via giant corporations is on the left. So MSNBC peddles in this social justice nonsense all the time. They constantly attack white people, constantly attack Christians, constantly attack straight people. It's what the, the network is doing. Now you may wonder why would NBC, a giant corporation, be just pushing racism all day long, but that is the, the path that I suppose MSNBC has decided is right in terms of making money, because at the end of the day, these guys just want to make money. 
So Michael Eric Dyson, who is a professor who has been on uh, Bill Maher's show probably two dozen times, um, he was on Joy Reid's show. Now, you know Joy Reid. This woman is not well. Um, if you pretend you're watching her show from a mental institution, it makes a hell of a lot more sense. Uh, he was on Joy Reid's show and he was attacking Winsome Sears. Now, who is Winsome Sears? Well, of course, as you guys know, last week, uh, Glenn Youngkin won the Virginia governor's race over Terry McAuliffe. Terry McAuliffe was the Democrat who said that parents shouldn't have anything to do with their kids' education. Critical race theory isn't in schools. You're all a bunch of racists, blah, blah, blah. Just a bad dude. So finally, we got that hope, right? I'm always talking about the hope in the distance. And we got some hope by Youngkin winning. Absolutely. Well, Winsome Sears is the lieutenant governor-elect. Now, she happens to be a black woman. Now, you would think that Michael Eric Dyson and Joy Reid and the people over at MSNBC who are always talking about systemic racism might be happy when a black woman uh, becomes so successful, uh, but they're not into it. Here's Michael Eric Dyson. The problem is here, they want, they want white supremacy by ventriloquist effect. There is a black mouth moving, but a white idea through the running on the runway of the tongue of a figure who justifies and legitimates uh, the white supremacist practices. We know that we can internalize in our own minds, in our own subconscious, in our own bodies, the very principles that are undoing us. So to have a black face uh, speaking in behalf of a white supremacist legacy is nothing new. And it is to the chagrin of those of us who study race that the white folk on the other side and the right wingers on the other side don't understand this is politics one-on-one and this is race not even one-on-one what's beneath one-on-one it's the it's the pre-k of race you should understand the fact that if you tell black people look i support a negro look there is a person of color that i am in favor of and that person of color happens to undermine and undercut and subvert the very principles about which we are concerned you do yourself no service by pointing to them as an example of your racial progressivism. God, there's an awful lot there. First off, I just want to reiterate, you will not find anything nearly that racist on Fox News today or on Newsmax tomorrow or any of those right-wing media outlets that these people are always freaking out about. That was abject, pure racism, not reverse racism, not special racism. It was just old fashioned racism. He thinks that this black woman, Winsome Sears, who has a pretty, pretty fantastic resume. And, and if you watch some of her talk on, the, on election night, like this woman's pretty spectacular. Okay, and I don't care about the color of her skin. These people racialize everything and then we have to unfortunately respond to it. His line there, a black mouth moving a white idea running on the runway. Like, how disgusting is that? Ideas don't have color. You're allowed to be whatever color you are and have different ideas, but he thinks that the color of his skin is the totality of his ideas. And that is so dangerous, it is actually racism. It is the very definition of prejudice, which is to prejudge. So if you just saw a black person walking down the street and you judge them as if I must know all of the things you think because you're black, that would be prejudice, right? So the more that black people succeed, the more that these race hucksters, and that's what they are, the more they will get angry. But this guy, Michael Eric Dyson, has been doing this for years and years and years. And as I said, he's on Bill Maher's show all the time. He was actually on this Friday, and I'll get to that in just a second. But Michael reminded me that he actually did a debate with Jordan Peterson. This is about two and a half years ago, a little bit before COVID. I think maybe I was on tour with Jordan at the time, if I'm not mistaken, about two and a half years ago. And they were debating uh, race and a whole bunch of other stuff. You know, all the, all the stuff that we always talk about on this show. These are the monk debates. And here's Michael Eric Dyson and then listen to Jordan Peterson's response. But that is to be complicit in the very problem itself terminologically. You're beginning at a point that's, that's already uh, productive and controversial. You're saying, how can he get his equality back? Who are you talking about? Jordan Peterson, trending number one on Twitter? Jordan Peterson <laughs> with an international, in an international bestseller? I want him to tweet something out about me and my book, <clears throat> Jordan Peterson, right? This is what I'm saying to you. Why the rage, bruh? You, you, you're doing well, but you're a mean, mad white man. And you're going to get us right. And... Well, what I derive from that 
series of rebuttals, let's say, is twofold. The first is that saying that the radical left goes too far when they engage in violence is not a sufficient response by any stretch of the imagination because there are sets of ideas in radical leftist thinking that led to the catastrophes of the 20th century and that was at the level of idea not at the level of violent action it's a very straightforward thing to say you're against violence it's like being against poverty it's like you know gener generically speaking decent people are against uh, poverty and violence it doesn't address the issue in the least um, and with regards to my privilege or lack thereof I mean, I'm not making the case that I haven't had advantages in my life and disadvantages in my life like most people. You don't know anything about my background or where I came from, and it doesn't matter to you because fundamentally I'm a mean white man. That's a hell of a thing to say in a debate. God, I love that ending there by Jordan, right? Like, you don't know anything about my life, but fundamentally I'm a mean white man. Like, that's what you've distilled my existence down to. I just want to say one other thing just on the, on the Jordan front. And by the way, I'm interviewing Jordan tomorrow. I talked to him this morning and we're gonna do a, a little different type of interview than we normally would. It's gonna be a little more push and pull and open conversation. Um, but when I was on tour with Jordan for a year and a half, um, I never saw him angry. There were times that he was sort of upset about something or he would get a hit piece written and whatever, but he would always try to, to give the benefit of the doubt to the writer. He would always try to de-escalate tensions, all of those things, but all Dyson, has left is you're a mean white man. I mean, really, I know you guys know Jordan well enough. Is he a mean white man? And if he is mean, does it have anything to do with his skin color? And has he ever said he's better than anyone because of his skin color? So I love the way Jordan just calmly and rationally did that because you somebody seemed mean there, uh, but it was not Jordan Peterson. Um, and also, you know, this is what is wrong with almost everything. The people who racialize, I mean, I know I say this all the time, but the people who racialize everything are the ones who are calling everyone else racist. Now, for this guy, Michael Eric Dyson, this has been going on for years and years. He's been on Bill Maher all the time. I was actually at a show a couple years ago, uh, sitting in the audience, and um, he they did the overtime segment. This is after the show, they do like an extra segment for YouTube, and I'm gonna slightly paraphrase what happened here, but they started talking about reparations. And he said that he's not really for reparations, but he said something to the effect of, if you see a young black brother, you should, high school kid, you should buy him. If you're a white woman, you should buy him a, a laptop or an iPad, something like that. And everyone in the audience was clapping like seals. Like they're just clapping, clapping. And I'm watching this woman in front of me, and this was really what I was, still in the wake up phase to, to what's going on with the left. I'm watching this woman, this probably 65 year old woman, white woman in front of me, clapping and it's like they clapped for it like oh yes buy a young black kid a computer yes 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 then we're good liberals okay zippity dippity ya ha ha but it's like lady of course she didn't do that right but that's what they do they virtue signal about everything that lady i assure you that was sitting in front of me did not do that anyway he's on bill maher show all the time and we've got a little uh, recap from bill maher show this past friday uh, when michael eric dyson was on the show again this is from fox news uh, Real-time host Bill Maher had a tense exchange about critical race theory in schools on Friday night's show with guest Michael Eric Dyson, a Vanderbilt University professor. Maher kicked off the show's panel discussion by addressing how Democrats got their ass kicked in Tuesday's elections, particularly in Virginia, where the issue of education dominated the gubernatorial race won by Republican Glenn Youngkin. Dyson argued that parents were spooked by CRT, even though none of them can define it, and suggested that they were outraged only because black history was now being centered in the school curriculum. But I find that a disingenuous argument because I don't think that's what people are objecting to, the host Mar reacted. They are not objecting to black history being taught. They are other, there are other things going on in the schools, like what, Dyson asked like separating children based on race, Ma responded, and describing them as either oppressed or oppressor. I mean, there are children coming home who feel traumatized by this. That's what parents are objecting to. So first off, of course, of course, of course, I wanna give credit where credit is due. Bill Maher is 100% right. He is absolutely right. You all know that this stuff is leaking into the schools. The more the media gaslights you and pretends and tells you that it's not happening, or they'll, the Randy Weingarten, the teachers unit, we don't teach critical race theory, but everyone should know about critical race theory. They lie about absolutely everything. Mike Larry Dyson, also, it's just completely disingenuous to say that people who are objecting to critical race theory don't know what it's about. We've defined it 
a bajillion times and parents are waking up to exactly what it is, but in the most simplest terms, as Carol Swain, one of my guests last week at NatCon, said it's actually a white supremacist idea that white people have the power over black people more than anything else. And you're gonna say that everything boils down to race and there are inherently good and bad people based on race. That's what the old white supremacists would have said. Now it's what the tolerant lefties would say. Um, so he's, he's just, I don't like talking about people in this regard, but this person is promoted constantly and that's actually why I wanted to do this segment because this brings me to something that I have been thinking about a lot and you know I'm a bit frustrated with and I'm trying to figure out what to do and I would love your thoughts on this uh, if you wanna drop me a line. Uh, but Bill Maher for years has been putting this Michael Eric Dyson guy on the show as like a, you know, just he's got his lefty, he's on the show, he's a black guy, they talk about race, okay, fine. Well, it was obvious that he was ushering in all of these stupid ideas. Now Bill Maher is against these ideas. I didn't watch the full show on Friday, but I doubt Bill Maher said he was fully happy that Youngkin won. Like Bill Maher, who's been railing against these things, should be screaming. I'm thrilled that the Republican won, right? Like they were about to usher in more of these anti-liberal, these illiberal ideas. Um, so this shows you my frustration with, with the last remaining liberals. I would love to get to a conclusion with some of this stuff. And I know you Bill Maher uh, producers watch the show, so I'm saying hello to you right now, as always. Uh, this is an interesting position. If, if you get all the, you, you usher in these ideas, right? So this is sort of what, what's happened with the liberals. They ushered in all of these ideas at the universities, on these TV shows, culturally and everything else. Then it gets to a point where it's like, oh, this is too much. I mean, boys and girls are a little bit different. Like America is not an evil country, but you ushered it all in. Then you finally say, okay, we've got to do something about this. But until you take that final step and like Bill Maher should have been applauding, I will gladly correct me, myself if I'm wrong, but if at the beginning of the show he was like, this is the greatest thing ever, Republicans gotta win here, it's a huge pushback against critical race theory, this is an absolute uh, seminal moment in the culture war, like some good things are happening. I'm guessing he didn't do that, but I would gladly do a mea culpa on this tomorrow, that these liberals that in essence are ushering it all in, and then at the end, they don't really tell you what to do or they don't, they don't say what they're honestly, what their honest assessment of things is. And I get the counter argument, by the way, because I hear people say this, uh, but you know, they're easing people into it and everything else. But at some point that becomes also kind of dangerous, right? Like if you don't get people to the end conclusion, which as I always say is that you don't have to be a Republican, but you certainly can't be a Democrat. Um, if you don't get people to the end conclusion, then you're just playing this sort of shell game. And I'm not sure what the end outcome of that is. I like people who do. That's what I like. I like people who get to the end of the conclusion. And even if it's uncomfortable, you know what I mean? Like you're gonna lose friends. Like Bill Maher, you're gonna lose your Hollywood friends. You really will. But you've got enough money. You've got a big enough house. You, you, you've had success for all these years. Like maybe, it, maybe the flaw is within your ideology itself. Anyway, I don't mean this to attack Bill Maher really. Again, I think it's a net good basically, but I think you see my point. Uh, all right, let's go. A couple locals comments before we move on. Uh, Priska says, are there preschoolers on Twitter? Uh, and isn't he a bird? Can't he tweet without Twitter? Well, that's a great point about tweeting without Twitter. That's actually really funny that are, are there preschools on Twitter, right? Because Big Bird is verified on Twitter as if there's any like little kid like scrolling Twitter, like, oh, what did Big Bird say today? Right, so that even shows you the absurdity even more. I mean, it's just, it's just absolutely endless. Uh, guys, my full interview with uh, Dr. Drew is up right now. You can watch that on Rumble or on Blaze TV or on YouTube. And we've got a whole bunch of interviews. I did a bunch of mini interviews at NatCon, which again was such a great conference and really trying to figure out, can this alliance of liberals, old school liberals, conservatives, libertarians, the religious right, like can we all meld into something to stop the Marxists and then hash out our differences at the end? Maybe we can, maybe we can't. I mean, that was the, that was the theme of the entire conference. Like we're trying to do it, but maybe this can't work. We don't know, but it's better than just, uh, you know, just waving the white flag. So I've got interviews with Jack Posobiec, Douglas Murray, Christopher Russo, Jerome Hazoni, Michael Knowles, Liz Wheeler, Soab Amari, Carol Swain, Seth Dillon from Babylon B and Jack Murphy are all up. You can get them wherever you get my videos. As always, if you wanna play along, rubenreport.locals.com. And I think, uh, I think that's it. You have anything to add? No, nope. you got anything? Nope, that's it. See you tomorrow.